We are continuing in a series uh, that we are calling My Favorite Verse. Uh, Gabe, our student pastor, kicked it off a, a couple weeks ago uh, when he shared uh, from the book of Romans the way it's impacted his life. Um, I began uh, last week the, the first of a, of a two-parter that I'll round out today. Uh, and, 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 and Jeff, our fearless leader, is fresh back from vacation and will impart with us all kinds of wisdom next week. So we look forward to that when he finishes up this series for us. Uh, last week, I did begin by talking about an area of Scripture that had a significant impact on my life. Uh, it wasn't just one verse. Everybody, some people have their life verse. I feel like I have a life section of Scripture. It's really kind of a, a train of thought. And it was powerful to my life because when I look back, I can say that the truth in that section of Scripture, it's what really saved me from kind of a, a, a ho-hum, boring Christian life, a, a life where I would just occupy a seat on a Sunday morning and I would look at other people and it other people felt like they really got this idea of faith, and you could tell that it's making a difference in how they live, and, and I wanted that so bad, and, and really this area of Scripture kind of empowered me to have it. And, and I really only thought, um, not growing up in the church and, and coming to faith kind of uh, when I was 18 years old, I really thought that there wasn't ever going to be a place for me in the kingdom of God. I thought that was for everybody else. Other people have skills and abilities they can use, but but not me. I'm, I'm just taking up a spot on Sunday morning and, and until the afterlife. And, and this area of Scripture really changed it for me. And, and what it is, it's an area of Scripture that talks about the importance of the resurrection of Christ uh, to the life that we're living right here, right now. Now, as it pertains to the resurrection of Christ, um, I noticed that there are many followers of Jesus today who lived how I lived for many years. Uh, and that's that they understood the resurrection of Jesus solely from a historical perspective. But they don't know how it happened. Uh, but by faith, they, they believe they did. They don't know what impact it has on their spiritual life. Um, but, but they know that it means that something big, they just don't know what. They don't know how it makes a difference here and now. And all they know is that they celebrate it once a year, Easter. That's when we talk about the resurrection. Aside from that, that they're not too sure, don't think too much of what the resurrection of Christ means for their life today. And I think somewhere on down the road is a group of Christians, a group of believers, who also spent time where I did. And, and that's at a place where, yes, you understand the resurrection of Christ from a historical perspective. You truly believe that it happened. But you also kind of understand the spiritual implications of that as well. Um, you understand that, that, that it happened, and because it happened, um, that you're going to have a, uh, an afterlife as well. Because Jesus rose from the dead, um, you have hope for eternity as well. And that is correct. The resurrection of Christ did happen, and it has implications for the afterlife. However, as I see today, there's far too many followers of Jesus who struggle or, or are unaware of what Christ's resurrection means for our life right here, day by day, moment by moment. Eugene Peterson, an author and a pastor, he passed many years ago, but he had a powerful quote about this. He says, resurrection does not have to do exclusively with what happens after we are buried or cremated. It does have to do with that, but first of all, it has to do with the way we live right now. That, that power that raised Christ from the dead, it's not solely reserved for the afterlife. But, but what I want us to see is how that power is available on this side of the pearly gates too. And then this is so important, I said this last week, if we don't understand what the resurrection of Christ means for our life, then we will never live the life that Christ has in store for us. If we don't understand what the resurrection of Christ means for us here and now, we'll never live the life that Christ has in store for us. Because a proper understanding of the resurrection, it's so important because it can change everything in our life if we let it. And last week, we, we talked about the, the, this verse that we're drawing our inspiration from over these two weeks. It's, it's from uh, the, the Apostle Paul. He, he was a church leader, and he wrote many letters to different churches. And, and he wrote a couple letters to this church that met in this area called Corinth. It was, it was a city. And, and specifically, we're covering a section of his first letter to that church. Now, now, this church was in kind of a precarious situation, and I think, historically, I think today, actually, there's a lot of churches that find themselves here. And what it was is that this church that met in Corinth, it was facing a lot of Greek pressure. A lot of uh, Greek culture was kind of bleeding into the church. And, and specifically, that, that Greek culture believed that the resurrection of a body could never happen. And, 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 and it didn't matter if it was Christ or anybody. The, the resurrection of a body was, was garbage. And so, so a lot of these Christians in Corinth, they're kind of in the same spot that a lot of us are today, which is not really understanding what the resurrection means for this day-to-day -day life. And so, so Paul rather bluntly writes this to them. He says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all our preaching is useless. And he takes it a step further. And he says, and your faith is useless. And so if our faith is useless without the resurrection, then the resurrection must stand for something. 
So last week in part one, we talked about what the resurrection of Christ saves us from. And then there's a handful of things that the resurrection of Christ saved us from, and the first of which is the penalty of our sins. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but, but if, he, if he stayed in the tomb, if he was never resurrected, then, then, then he was nothing that he said he was. That death meant nothing. And so the resurrection is really what finalized that transaction, the penalty for our sins. It, it also means when, when Jesus was resurrected, it, it saved us from our old life. If a man can conquer death, then what can't he do in your life? What can't he do in my life? If he really, truly conquered death, if, if he defeated the undefeatable, if he conquered the unconquerable, then there's nothing that can stand in the way of him doing what you're willing to let him do in your life. We talked about last week how we don't have to be who we've always been because of Jesus. And then he also, uh, his resurrection saved us from the finality of death. And those are things that we get to rejoice in daily. So last week we talked about that section about, uh, about the resurrection from Paul at the church in Corinth. We talked about what it saved us from. And this week, we're going to take a different direction, talk about what the resurrection of Christ has saved us for. Because we have been given this life, we have been rescued, we have been redeemed, we have been saved not just for a seat in heaven, we've been saved for a purpose. In the movie Master and Commander, the, the captain of England's six-gun ship, it's, it's called the HMS Surprise, it actually starts engaging in battle with the most dreaded warship in Napoleon's army, and it's this uh, historical, very fierce battle there in the open sea. So after disabling the ship's sails, the, the captain of the HMS Surprise, he, he leads an assault onto the bridge of this enemy vessel. And they're fighting there, and they're finding some success, and then they make their way into the, the hold where a lot of the prisoners, their own prisoners uh, of the English ships are being held as captives. And there's this real pivotal scene where, where the captain breaks the chains uh, down and, and opens the door. And then these men are, are finally being set free. I can't imagine how hopeless and helpless they felt for who knows how long, but it's happening, the unthinkable. They've been set free. They've been set free from their dire situation. They've been set free from captivity. And it's this, it's this amazing scene where after each man exits the prison doors, freedom at last, they are handed a sword to re-engage in the fight. And yes, the men have been set free to step into a raging battle. Before, they were just prisoners. They, they were captives. But they've been saved free from that. So, so now they are being equipped to be conquerors. And when it comes down to it, this is our story. The resurrection of Christ has not only set us free from a fight, but the resurrection of Christ has set us free for the fight. I want to show you what that, that fight looks like. Uh, we're going to be reading in Matthew 28 in a minute. And in Matthew 28, 16, it occurs after Jesus' death, but before his resurrection, which must have been just so tragic for those early disciples because for, for them, they, they left everything to follow Jesus. They were really hoping he was who he said he was, but some of them doubted him, some denied, that they all fleed. Jesus died alone on, on a cross, and, and they had to be thinking after the death and before the resurrection. The disciples had to be thinking, man, we, we thought he was it. We believed everything. And so in that tragic time, it says uh, that they left for Galilee, and they were going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, so when they saw that Jesus was not dead, in fact, he was resurrected, Matthew tells us that, that they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. And if I try to put myself in their scenario, I, I would have doubted too. I would have completely doubted. I, I would have thought maybe I'm seeing things. I, I would have thought maybe the, the, the trauma and, and the stress of, of what I've been going through the past three days, it's just getting to my mind. When I think about those early disciples, I, I think what, what they doubted was actually the, the power of the resurrection. Because when you go throughout Scripture and you, and you see Jesus didn't keep what he was going to do secret from his disciples. He, he told them that he was going to rise from the dead. He shared prophecies with them, but, but they didn't think it was possible. Some of them doubted, and, and I hate to say it, but, but I think I would have doubted that too. Right? But, but that is what the power of Christ does. It, it goes beyond our expectations and ideas of what we think can and can't happen, whether it's in our life or in this world. Uh, but I remember that, I know, I, I, I think I would identify with those who doubted. I, I'm not proud of that, but I think I would have doubted too. And, 
Matthew 28 goes on. Jesus came and told the disciples, and this right here, this is the, the fight we've saved, been saved for. He says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. This right there is, is what we have been saved for. The, the reason why you have been rescued and redeemed is to introduce to other people Jesus Christ, your rescuer and, and redeemer. And, and that can seem intimidating to us. This idea that, that, that Jesus Christ him, himself would, would call us out of the stands and, and into the game. It just seems like such a heavy responsibility for, for people like you and I. And I think in the, that, that, that kind of analogy, that, that illustration of, of being in the game or, or in the stands, I, I think what keeps people in the stands is, is that they think Christianity is just about obeying a set of beliefs. And that's it. And, and I'll, I'll admit that, yeah, with the, being a Christian, it is about believing a set of, of beliefs. But, but what makes you from, go from the stands into the game is you don't view Christianity just as a set of beliefs, but you view it as a lifestyle that you're trying to live. And at the center of that lifestyle is to engage with a dark and fallen world with the purpose of fighting to make disciples. Now, if you think about the, the, those first few disciples that we just read about, man, that crew was a ragtag bunch that just lacked a lot of faith at times, and they were utterly clueless, mostly, about what Jesus was trying to do through them. Now, you can read through the scripture, and, and, and Jesus is, is serving people, and, and they're over there arguing about who's going to be greater in the kingdom of God. And Jesus would, would feed 5,000 people and th their stomachs would start grumbling and they'd say, I don't even know where we're going to get food. Uh, Jesus looked at one of them and said, get behind me, Satan. And that wasn't even the one that betrayed him. And, and I'm sure that, that, that this group, that in that moment when Jesus is saying, here's your responsibility, go and make disciples, they've got to be thinking, there's no way we can do this. You want us to take your message further than anyone's ever seen there? This is not the crew to do it, Jesus. That's an impossible goal. But, but Jesus handpicked them. He, he designed them to take that message and go and to make disciples. And if I would have been in that group and I would have looked around at us, if I was one of those disciples, I don't know what I would have had a, a harder time believing. That Jesus was resurrected. And if he was, you think we're going to be able to do this. I would have doubted it all. And I think when we consider the responsibility you have, when we think about what we've been saved for, it's to go and, and, and to make disciples. I know that a lot of us, we start to doubt our own abilities too. Uh, we think we don't have enough uh, uh, intellect. Well, I could probably do that if I was smarter. We, we think we don't have enough power. We think we don't have enough ability in our lives uh, to be the type of person that could fight for this, to be the type of person that can make disciples. And I think that is, that is the, the problem altogether. We, we think that we can achieve the Great Commission through our own power. And here's what Christ said to that idea, that, that is this really just on us? And what he said to those disciples 2,000 years ago on a mountain. He says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus wasn't asking his followers then, and he's not asking his followers now to fight to make disciples on his own. He's asking that we will come and fight alongside of him. He, he wasn't asking the disciples then. He's not asking us now to go and make disciples on our own through our own power. He's saying, no, no, do it through my power. And his power is all that we need. Uh, the book of Ephesians, it talks about in this fight that we have an enemy. And it says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There is real dark opposition to the work that Jesus asks us to do alongside of him. Through our own power, we're going to fail. But, but through Christ's power, he's already defeated what stands against us. Through Christ's power, this life of ours, it's just a victory parade where we're picking up disciples along the way. And as much as those disciples, those early ones, must have doubted themselves so much on the hillside, Jesus said, no, this is your time and this is your place. I need you to run your laps of this race. And now it's our time. We've been handed the baton. And I want to talk about what that looks like a, a little bit. 
what we do since we've been handed that baton. And we've been covering 1 Corinthians a little bit, and now we're going to look at Paul's second letter, that same church that met, uh, met in Corinth. And specifically, there's a section there called, uh, We Are God's Ambassadors. I didn't think too much about this idea of, of, of being an ambassador of, of anything until Julie and I lived in Maryland. And um, where we lived at in Maryland, when people would come visit us, there's usually a couple things they wanted to do. They, they wanted as many blue crabs as they could eat. They wanted a, a Philly cheesesteak uh, up north. And then they wanted to go down south to visit D.C. And so we spent a lot of time over nine years in D.C. And, and there's a certain area of D.C. And when you're walking around it, you'll see the, these buildings uh, that declare that they're, this is the office of an ambassador of some other country. Um, at times you would be walking down the street and you'd see a, a kind of a small police escort and you'd look over and at the center of that escort would be a pretty nice vehicle that, that on the side of it would let you know that this is driven by an ambassador of some specific country. They would usually have their flag on their hood or on the back. And, and so I started thinking more about this idea of being an ambassador. And, and in the case, historically speaking, and in D.C., an ambassador is a respected official and, and they're acting as that represent, representative of their, their sending nation. And they've been sent to a foreign land. They've been sent to Washington, D.C. And the ambassador's role was to reflect the official position of their home country. Uh, it was the, the, the task of an ambassador was a big deal because they were expected to show the exact values of the country they represented. Now, in this section that we're going to be diving into, when, when Paul, sa Paul says, you know, you and I, we're, we're now the ambassadors in this world. It is our responsibility because we've been saved from so much that we are now to reflect God's character to everyone around us. We have to become passionate about the things that he is passionate about. And about that, Paul says, because we understand, I'm going to highlight two things here, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. Now, I want to talk about that fearful responsibility. Uh, there, there's certainly uh, space and time in the church and in conversations and in, in sermons where we talk about the fear of God. This, he's so powerful, he's so holy. With this, there's this reverence and, and healthy, holy fear we have. But this isn't what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is, is a fearful responsibility. Uh, this week, as I was preparing this message, I thought about areas in my life where I've experienced this just kind of fearful responsibility. Um, one was in a job I worked at at a corporation. Uh, the, the, the president of that corporation trusted me more than I wanted to be trusted. Um, he drove a $130,000 Mercedes, and he would literally just throw the keys to me and say, hey, can you take this into town and pick up this for me and this for me and this for me? I didn't want to. Um, I didn't even want to breathe. I wouldn't park next to that vehicle if it was just him and I in the lot. Um, and I remember I, I would go and do it, and when I was behind that wheel, I was shaking, I was so nervous, I, I was so cautious to do everything he asked me to do and to get that car back just as I left it. It was this, this fearful responsibility. Another time was when I was, uh, went up in a private plane with uh, what I thought was a friend of mine. Um, we, we get up there and, 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 and he looks at me and he says, and, and we're just enjoying beautiful views of the Chesapeake Bay, and he looks at me and he said, I'm going to teach you how to fly. And I said, if I would have known that's what we were coming up here for, we wouldn't be in this thing in the first place. And he said, no, no, I'm, today you're going to learn how to fly. And I said, I'm not going to learn how to fly today. And he said, well, either we're going to crash or you're going to learn how to fly today. Yes. And then he took his hands off the, the, the little wheel there and, and off the pedals. And he said, now do as I say. And I remember I hung on every word he said, push, push the pedal. Pushing the pedal. Pull it up. We're going up. And I remember everything he said, I was like, I, I have to get this thing. I got to get me back in one piece. I have you back in one piece. I shouldn't be doing it. This is very illegal, but, 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 but very fearful responsibility. And, and I remember that. And so, so when Paul speaks about this fearful responsibility to the Lord, he, he's talking about this, the weightiness of this task that we've been given in this short life. And that task is to make disciples. And, and when we hear that Jesus said, this is the fight you've been saved for to make disciples, when we, when we hear that, we, it means we should be so intimidated by that, that we're motivated to give energy to it, that we pay close attention to detail because it's the biggest priority in our life. So Paul says there that we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, but then he says we work hard to persuade others. Now, now persuading is defined a, a, as causing someone to do something. And there's a lot of times in, in church and in Christianity where powerful people, 
they get conf- kind of persuasion and, and manipulation kind of intertwined, and you can't pull one from the other. So persuasion is causing someone to do something. Manipulation is about control. And there are way too many horror stories of manipulation in the church, manipulating people to, to come to faith. Shame, guilt, uh, pastors who, who preach false teachings, to, to have people give their lives to the thing that you're on stage lying about. So we're not talking about man- manipulation, we're talking about persuasion. And what Paul's saying is, is persuasion is healthy. It's choosing to do things that allow people to step closer to Jesus. It's choosing to love people in such a way that they want what we have. That's persuasion. And, and whether we are congregants or clergy, Paul is saying that this massive responsibility, it's laid in front of all of us. We have been saved for a role to bring others to Christ. And then he further states in 2 Corinthians, he says, in all of this, and we broke it out that when he's saying all of us, he's referencing having new life in Christ like we talked about last week. He says, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given all of us, congregants, clergy, given all of us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. This is what you and I have been saved for. The resurrection of Christ ensures that you and I not only have hope in the afterlife, but we're tasked with bringing people that hope in this life as well. And to make disciples, you don't need a degree. To make disciples, you don't need extraordinary talents. You don't need standout characteristics. You don't need the wildest of experiences. You don't need any of that. To make disciples, you don't need a platform. You don't need a stage. You certainly don't need a microphone strapped to your face. You don't need to be an author. You don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a prominent figure. In fact, I would say that, that it seems like those things get in the way more than they help. I want to be clear that you're never too young to start making disciples. And I want to be careful here. You're, you're never too seasoned to, 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 to make disciples either. It doesn't matter how young you are or how seasoned you are. We never retire out of making disciples. And I thought this week about if, if somebody was to hear this message and, and they want to know where to begin, how can measly old me actually start to nudge people towards Jesus? How can I do this with my life? Here, here's the easiest definition that I could come up with. Use who you are and all you have to show people the love of Christ. I, think it's, I, think it, I do think it's that simple. We just got to be very intentional. Just, just use who you are and all you have to show people the love of Christ. If you make this a priority in your life, your life is going to tell a powerful story. Use who you are. God knew exactly what he was doing when he made you. He is not taken back by your missteps. In fact, he's already taken your missteps into account. And he has intentionally brought your life together so it can lead people to his love. And you, you don't need another life to impact the kingdom of God, you just need to start believing that God is willing to use the life you're already living. Use who you are and all you have to show people the love of Christ. It's really that easy. We just got to be intentional about it. And the band can come back up while, while I share this story. It's anytime I get a chance to, to, to share this story, I do because it's, it's so powerful and it really highlights this idea of using what, who we are and what we have to make a difference. And there's this couple that were missionaries to Africa, and, and they, they relayed this story, and it's, people have used it for, for many years. But uh, this missionary couple in Africa, they, they told the story of this, this elderly woman that because of their efforts, uh, she, she came to, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and, and she was blind. Um, she couldn't read. She couldn't write. She was more seasoned in, in age. But because of her newfound faith in Jesus, because she realized what she was saved from, she wanted to play a role on God's team. She believed she was saved for a purpose. And so she went to the missionary couple and said, how can I share my faith with others? And the missionary couple were, were a bit perplexed. She, she's blind. She can't read. She can't write. She, she's older. What, what, what can they do? And well, she had an idea. She, she went to the missionary couple and she, she asked for a copy of the Bible in French because that's what the, the local language was. And, and when she got it, she, she looked at it, and the missionary couple, they're thinking, what is she doing? She, she's blind. And, 
And she, she asked the missionary couple, she said, will you turn to John 3, 16? And they said, okay. She said, will you put a marker in there for me? So they, they put a little bookmark in there. And she said, now will you, will you highlight in red John 3, 16? They said, okay. So John 3, 16, she can easily find it. She can't read it. Highlight in red, give her the Bible, and she went. So the missionary couple are wondering, what is she doing? Like, what is she going to do with this? And so, so they decided to follow her. When you don't know what to do, just stalk. And so, so, so they followed her right? Don't take that part to heart. Uh, let's just be clear. Um, this, that's going to be on some tweet later. Yeah. Um, but so they followed her, and, and she goes to, to the local school, and it's, it's an all-boys uh, school, high school. And she stood outside the doors, and they're thinking, what is going on? And when the students were dismissed, she would go up to them and, and, and say, excuse me, and they'd, they'd stop for her. And uh, she said, do you read French? And they said, we do. And she said, can you open the Bible to the marker? And They'd open it, and they'd say, now what? And she said, do you see where the red is highlighted? And they said, yeah. She said, can you read that out loud? And they would read it out loud. And she would just simply ask them, do you know what that means for your life? And many would say no, and then she would go on and tell them about Jesus Christ. The missionary couple said she did this for years. And then that missionary couple said that this old woman who, who couldn't read, couldn't write, and was blind, that because of her simple efforts— there were 24 boys who gave their life to Christ, and many became pastors in full-time ministry. Use who you are and all that you have to show people the love of Christ. Because Jesus has a way of blessing our efforts when we choose to fight for what matters most to him. And that's the hearts of people. That every single one of us, we have all we need to show people the love of Christ. If you have a house, have people over. If you can cook really, really well, have me over. Uh, I'd, I'd love to come over. Um, if you just think you, you have kindness, just show it. If you, if you think you're funny, find some honest friends first. And then if they say you are funny, just go and make people smile. Just bring a smile to their faces. If you have free time and don't fill it with you stuff, go and serve people. If you've been gifted with incredible resources... Man, there's that, that gets tricky in the Bible when it says that, you know, the, the scriptures make it seem like it's going to be really hard. It says like a camel going through the eye of a needle for rich people to inherit the kingdom of God. But I tell you what, if you have incredible resources, just think about this. If Jesus had your bank account, how would he use it? Then just go and do that. If you have skills, no matter what they are, use them to benefit others. If, if you have nothing than that, but you have ears, just listen to people. People need us to listen better. If you've been blessed with an empathetic spirit, encourage people, write cards, mail it to them. Even if you've come through some battles you're not proud of, I promise you, in your midst, God has placed people who are going through those same battles. Walk them through victory just like you've been walked through victory. It's real simple if we're serious about being intentional. Use who you are and all you have to show people the love of Christ. When I think about my life today, what changed my eternal and, and momentary trajectory? It was two things. There was a youth minister who had an Xbox, which is a video game system, and he unlocked the gym for me to play basketball. A video game system and a round ball changed my trajectory. All because there was one man in my life who was serious about using who he was and what he had to show me the love of Christ. And I bet it's true for, for most, if not all of us. When you think about the reason you're here today, when you think about the reason that you take Jesus Christ seriously, that you're even open to this, it's because there are people in your life who used who they were and what they had to show you the love of Christ. They were that intentional with you. And it worked. It worked in my life, it worked in your life, and it will work in other people's lives because Jesus has a way of blessing those efforts when we choose to fight for what matters most to him, and that's always going to be the hearts of people. It's the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we have been saved from so much, and I hope we see today that we've been saved for so much as well. Let's pray.